Good afternoon. How is everybody doing this afternoon? Buenas tardes a todos. Uh, I hope everybody is here uh, to listen to some great speakers. Uh, my name is Raul Reyes. I'm the Dean of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. It's my pleasure and privilege to open and welcome you to this event, uh, which is part of the National Whistleblower Tour for the Government Accountability Project, GAP. Uh, this is an event, we are very proud to host this event once again for the second time. We did this last year. Uh, in this year, we'll concentrate, the event will concentrate on financial whistleblowing, a very timely issue, as you can imagine. And I wanted to thank a few people who were able to help us co-sponsor this event. First of all, uh, Professor Fred Blevins uh, for bringing the tour once again, uh, from helping us to bring the tour. Uh, and also the FIU College of Law, uh, the School of Accounting, and the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. So we want to thank all of them for helping us uh, co-sponsoring and uh, bringing these wonderful speakers to campus. Uh, you get an opportunity of uh, hearing them. Uh, but I wanted to bring uh, Professor Blevins uh, to the lectern to talk about, to introduce the speakers, uh, give you a little more information about the event. And thank you again for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, this is my uh, second year of um, coordinating this event for the Government Accountability Project, and uh, it's been a it's it's a it's a very fulfilling experience. We get to meet very very interesting people, two of whom you're going to, I hope, uh, uh, enjoy and appreciate uh, here this afternoon. Um, I'm, my involvement with the Government Accountability Project started about three or four years ago. Uh, when they started, um, this is basically a law firm, non-profit law firm in Washington whose primary uh, mission is to represent whistleblowers. And I was asked to uh, help them to, to, as a group of faculty members across the United States to start figuring out how to take the stories that, of people like you're going to hear today and turn them into pedagogy and bring them into the classroom so that we can sort of spread the word about this and educate people about the importance of whistleblowing in a democracy. And uh, since then, you know, it's sort of expanded into a number of other things like GAP has, and their, their influence is increasing not just in the United States but across the world as every day goes by. So, um, uh, and, and my association with, uh, with GAP uh, started with a, a fellow by the name of uh, Lewis Clark, who's a right over here, and uh, Lewis is the senior most member of the, uh, doesn't mean he's the oldest, it just means that he's been there longer than anyone else at the Government Accountability Project. He is uh, serving as the president, and he also heads up the section uh, that deals with corporate whistleblowers like the two we have today. Um, Lewis has a very unusual background. He uh, comes, uh, he was <laughs> an ordained uh, Methodist minister who um, uh, then found, I guess, another Jesus and went to law school. Um, which, uh, and then, I guess, after you're an ordained Methodist minister and you have a law degree, I guess your only choice is to practice nonprofit law. I, I, I mean, is that a pretty good, I mean, what else would you do, right? It's not like you could go to Wall Street. So, uh, anyway, so he's been, uh, he, he has been with GAP uh, since the 1970s, and uh, he is at, I think he is the heart and soul of the organization. He's going to be the moderated, moderated day, moderator today. Thank God, because I can't talk. But he is, uh, so uh, join me in giving a very warm FIU welcome to Lewis Clark. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, we were here last year. The hospitality uh, at Florida International is extraordinary, uh, and we've just had a great time. I see some students here in some of the classes that we've been to, uh, and uh, I've 
I, I'm just enormously impressed that, that we just have wall-to-wall -wall questions uh, throughout the lectures that we've been giving. So uh, there's a great deal of interest, uh, I can tell, from the campus, and certainly a great deal of knowledge, because it takes knowledge to ask the kind of questions that we've been receiving. So it's really been a pleasure to be here. And um, we look forward to coming back next year and next year and next year, so uh, if we're invited. <laughs> so, uh, and so I just want to describe very quickly what the Government Accountability Project is, uh, so you ha have a sort of sense of where we're coming from uh, as an organization. And then uh, hopefully we'll then get into the meat of the meeting and introduce you to two of my heroes. Uh, and, uh, and, and people who I think that you'll be very impressed and, and uh, interested in hearing from. Uh, first of all, the Government Accountability Project does four things. Uh, we're, uh, as Fred indicated, we're lawyers for whistleblowers. And so in that sense, we're just like any other law firm. Uh, we represent a particular client, and those are the clients who are working somewhere, they see wrongdoing, uh, and then they uh, come to us to help them through the struggle of either revealing what they've discovered at the workplace uh, or uh, trying to get their job back if it hasn't gone so well for them. So anyway, that's our practice. We have represented 5,000 whistleblowers since 1978. And uh, a second thing we do is we try to do something in terms of reform about the issues that they're blowing the whistle on. Uh, and in that sense, we're different than most law firms. And uh, most law firms, they don't really care quite as much about the issue uh, as we do at the Government Accountability Project. And the reason for that is every, uh, every survey that's ever been done of employees, especially employees who have seen wrongdoing but they didn't do anything about it. And so they survey these people no, why didn't you do anything about it? You saw the $100,000 worth of waste or fraud, uh, and you didn't do anything about it. You saw public health and safety problems, and you didn't do anything about it. Why? And the answer is that from 60 to 70 percent of the people is that nothing would be done about it. It wasn't fear of losing their jobs, although that's 40 percent, and it used to be 20 percent. It's actually gone up. But so it's not fear about losing their jobs, it's that nothing will be done. That I'll be taking this risk and I'll end up, you know, taking the risk but accomplishing nothing. So we discovered, you know, this, these surveys indicated to us that if we as a project did something about the concerns that these people have raised, that more and more people might come forward and raise similar types of concerns. And so that has been a part of what we do. And just to mention just some of the cases that we've done, but I don't want to dwell on them because we have two people who are bringing you a whole nother universe uh, that I'm not even going to mention here because you'll hear from them. And that's the banking finance. But in terms of, uh, in the early days, we had 600 whistleblowers who blew the whistle on nuclear power and problems mostly with quality assurance, quality assurance programs at nuclear power plants across the country. Many of them that were just being built at that time were just being completed. Uh, there was, at one time in this country, we predicted that there would be 240 nuclear power plants. It never got to that level, and mostly because there were 600 whistleblowers who were blowing the whistle on the failure of the quality assurance programs that went into building these nuclear plants. In terms of nuclear weapons, whistleblowers that came to us blew the whistle on plutonium production in the United States. And what few people know is that we actually stopped producing plutonium in this country before the end of the Cold War. And that was because whistleblowers were revealing how, what a contaminated process that was and that there was a lot of plutonium that was disappearing. Uh, another area, food safety. We've had over 400 whistleblowers in terms of food safety, mostly meat and poultry inspectors uh, who are blowing the whistle on the failure of safety. And in particular, what's noteworthy is that over the last 20 years, I guess, you know, well, actually longer, 
uh, actually since the early or sort of the mid 1980s, uh, there has been an effort across the country to turn the quality assurance at poultry and meat processing facilities over to the companies and away from government inspection. So many of these whistleblowers are blowing the whistle on these attempts and every time that these people have stood up and said, wait a minute, bad meat is getting into the public and, and at the simultaneously what often happens is that people are dying as a result of contaminated meat and then all of a sudden it stops this deregulation. So deregulation in the meat industry has not occurred as you know, as nationwide as would have happened had it not been for the whistleblowers. Uh, in addition to that, the Vioxx drug is no longer on the market. A billion, a multi-billion dollar drug for the Merck company, but one whistleblower at the Food and Drug Administration um, essentially established that 45,000 people had died and there were 135,000 heart attacks and strokes as a result of the Vioxx drug. Uh, and yet, up until that whistleblower came forward, a scientist at the FDA, but until that whistleblower came forward, there weren't even warnings on the drug that they had any impact whatsoever on anything related to the heart. Um, so that whistleblower stopped that production um, despite enormous amount of pressure from the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, finally, and sadly, um, because it's one of the, the saddest, um, uh, probably our saddest experiences at the Government Accountability Project is two days ago one of our clients went to prison um, because he blew, blew the whistle on torture in the United States. Uh, he, was, he worked for the CIA. Uh, he revealed that torture, that waterboarding was torture, or he gave that opinion. Uh, and uh, for his whistleblowing, in our view, and we cannot prove this, so it is my opinion, I'm not stating it as fact, that that's why he was prosecuted. Uh, I'm not saying that what he, I'm not saying that he did not violate the law, because according to the prosecution, um, he revealed the name of a CIA torturer uh, in, in a background discussion that he had with a member of the media, and there is a law against that. So I'm not saying he might, he might have violated the law. But what's interesting, and is important to all of us, I think, is that the only person in the United States that has been prosecuted for anything related to torture has been one whistleblower. The people who came up with the, the torture program, people who carried it out, uh, people who burned the tapes and, and the evidence of the torture, also against the law, also criminal. All those people were let off, but one person went to, uh, to jail. And one other person uh, who also almost went to jail is another client, Tom Drake, who blew the whistle on the National Security Agency's program of surveillance of the United States citizens. Um, this this program has had widespread, it has gotten widespread national attention. Uh, he faced 10 felony counts uh, for his whistleblowing there. We were quite sure it had to do with the fact that they thought that he had taken the evidence or the information about, about the surveillance and given it to the New York Times, which ended up not. That didn't happen. Uh, but nevertheless, he was faced with 10 felony counts and then last year, um, well, in July of uh, 2011, uh, he was, uh, he pleaded guilty to misusing a government computer and instead of facing 35 uh, years in prison for 10 felony counts, five of which had to do with spying, uh, he ended up getting a $25 fine. So we won that case, um, but uh, other cases we haven't won. But just to, that's just a small sampling of the kind of cases that certainly come to us, but it, it also is a small sampling of the type of enormous national issues and concerns that these whistleblowers have had an absolutely instrumental part in revealing. And you'll see now uh, what we'll be talking about is the banking 
uh, industry and the impact that these whistleblowers have had and are having uh, on the banking industry. And um, so that's, we will move on. I would like to say just in, if you see the program, um, I hope that you'll sort of see this sort of, you know, in order to sort of capture the experience of whistleblowing, we've, you know, gone all over our cases. We've been doing this for a long time. And we can say that there's sort of six stages of whistleblowing uh, that are a whole process of, of whistleblowing that are true in most cases, not every case. And first, and so I, w I won't dwell on these, but it will be the sort of the, the, the uh, questioning that I, that I provide to the panel and the questions that they'll be responding to is going to be along the line of this sort of uh, category or this uh, process of whistleblowing. So first of all, we're going to be talking about the dis discovery. These people, whistleblowers, are just like you and just like me. There's nothing special about them except they're often the highest qualified people in the job. They're often the, the most dedicated, the most, uh, also the ones that believe in the institutions that they work for. So they're the type of employee that every employer would want. But other than that, they're just like all the rest of us. And <clears throat> then they discover something. So it's first of all discovering that problem. Second all, second, is what do they do about it? So it's the disclosure. And there's lots of ways of disclosing something. I mean, it counts in terms of the law, uh, in terms of disclosing it to your boss. That's also covered in terms of whistleblower protection. Um, and the next thing that often happens is the retaliation. How does that institution respond to the, that individual whistleblower? So we always are dealing with retaliation. It might be very slight. It might be, you know, absolutely horrible. We've even had cases where children were removed from the family uh, as a result of, I mean, as the process of retaliation. So it can be really extreme. It's all over the place, but it does almost always happen in some fashion. Um, next is isolation. Most whistleblowers go through a period where no longer, people no longer want to work I mean, you know, have lunch with them. You know, people no longer want to be seen with them. When, you know, and they and you sort of know, when you walk into a room and all of a sudden no one's looking at you, you know, it's like, you know, it's like you sort of get an idea that, no, you know, people don't want to be associated with you. Or you're on a task force uh, that you used to have and all of a sudden the task force is meeting and you're not there. Uh, you know, that's, you know, isolation. And it's during this period and certainly in terms of us as the counsel for these people, is we try very much, you know, if the people are still on the job or wherever they are, and when they're going through this period of isolation, we try to tell people, don't, just because people are ignoring you, just, people, just because people don't want to be seen with you, that doesn't mean that they're against you or they're going to, that they're your enemy. You do not treat those people as your enemy because despite, this, despite everything in this whole process of whistleblowing, most people are not going to lie under oath. So the very people who are not wanting to have lunch with you, they're still, you know, they're still, they're not going to come up there and, you know, they're not going to testify under oath and lie for the company. The head of the company might lie, as we'll learn, um, but these, the average person is not going to do that. And so this period of isolation, and then I'm getting to the good news, is there's this, uh, time that is so precious, which is solidarity. And that's where people like you start associating with whistleblowers. Today is an event where Florida International University has become part of the process of giving some level of solidarity, showing some level of solidarity and support for people who go through this experience. Gap. As, a, uh, as counsel for whistleblowers, we're part of that solidarity process. Part of the process is just fellow employees sending emails or talking to them, you know, when no one's looking and saying, you know, we're with you, you know, or, um, you know, good luck. I mean, it's, you know, one of the things that in this whole process of whistleblowing that we try to do as an organization is bring support. It's sort of, Okay, you have a company, let's say, you have an institution here. You have a whistleblower inside the institution. 
then all of a sudden this person's very isolated and the institution just is coming at them from all sides. They're really in a bad situation. However, look what happens when all of a sudden the information gets out of the institution and then you have the New York Times or you have the Financial Times or, you, you know, or Washington Post or you have a congressional committee or you have a bunch of public interest groups. And then all of a sudden all these other groups outside of this institution is putting pressure on the institution in solidarity with the people on the inside. And it changes the dynamic. All of a sudden the institutions on trial, not just the whistleblower. And so that changes things. So that's an important, you know, uh, an important part, pro part of the process. And then finally, vindication. Vindication is when you win. You don't win everything, and it's a long process, and Michael's been in the process for seven years, and he's not done. He's won a jury ver verdict. We'll talk about it. He's won a jury ver verdict in his favor, uh, demanding $4 million uh, compensation from uh, Countrywide and Bank of America. So that's vindication. Vindication is where all of a sudden the public s hears the story and they believe the whistleblower. That's vindication. Coming here, being invited here, presenting here is vindication. And so that's, um, so we'll be talking about that. Uh, one, other comment, which I actually I was talking about what we do, uh, I forgot a piece. A third piece of what we do is we work on legislation to help protect whistleblowers. In the last six years, 100,000 people have whistleblower protection in the private sector that didn't have it six years ago. 100 million people. And so there's been an absolute revolution. And this is one of the only business schools in the country that has invited us in to talk about companies and the new rules. So it's not quite, you know, it's, it's starting here, but it's not quite happened. It's not gotten through academia yet about what a revolution this is when all of a sudden the entire private sector practically now have whistleblower protection in all kind of segments, healthcare, uh, food, uh, uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, so Wall Street reform, uh, the stimulus package, all contractors to the government. I mean, it's just a huge swaths of the private sector now have dynamic whistleblower protection, and that's a total change of what used to be. And the fourth thing we do is, of course, come out and talk to people all over the country about what whistleblowing is all about. So that's um, so, with all that introduction, I'd like to introduce our speakers now. Um, and I will read, because I, I know so much and I will talk so much if I don't. So I'm going to read the introduction so I'll have the, uh, you all have the benefit of brevity, actually. Um, first of all, to my far left and your far right, uh, in December, 2012, Dr. Eric Ben Artsy chose to publicly come forward with his evidence of multi billion dollar securities violations at Deutsche Bank, the world's largest bank. Eric internally reported possible securities violations stemming from, from the bank's failure to accurately report the value of its credit derivatives portfolio essentially by keeping the inaccurate valuations on their books, Deutsche Bank was able to maintain its carefully crafted public image that it was weathering the financial crisis better than its peers. After being subjected to escalating retaliatory tactics, Eric approached a prominent law firm and Gap, not necessarily prominent, soon after he was still fired. But with everyone working together, a major news outlet revealed the wrongdoing, rocking the financial world. Reports have shown that Deutsche Bank hid up to $12 billion in losses, and that independent economics experts have now backed Eric's allegations. And that happened just in December. And by the way, this is his first time ever speaking about these experiences. To drive home the importance of these allegations, the Financial Times reported 
that if Lehman Brothers had preceded how Deutsche Bank did, that company might still be in business. Whereas if Deutsche had marked its books correctly, it might have been Lehman. <clears throat> Eric is one of the first whistleblowers to go public while engaged in the SEC, Security Exchange Commission whistleblower process under the new Dodd-Frank law. And he joins us today for his first appearance, as I said. Could you stand up? Now, Michael, Michael Winston, after joining Countrywide in 2005, Michael was quickly promoted. But almost from the beginning, Michael found internal problems with the company. He was tasked with helping to develop better managers to grow the company, which was expanding at an enormous rate. Um, something like 15,000 to 60 some thousand, 65,000 uh, in three years. Enormous growth. When Moody's Investors Services expressed concern about countrywide secession planning and governance issues, Winston was asked to write a report to essentially what he found out later, but essentially falsely allay concerns. However, as Winston investigated, he could not find any secession plan, nor could, de nor could he determine if even one existed. He refused to write the report, and as the New York Times later wrote, Mr. Winston had the audacity to question countrywide practices. Mr. Mozillo Countrywide's CEO and one of the top financial bigwigs in New York at the time was not pleased. And before long, Mr. Winston was marginalized and later dismissed. Michael was let go around the same time that Countrywide was purchased by Bank of America. And after a three-year legal struggle, a California jury awarded Michael nearly $4 million, which I think is up around $5 million now because of interest, uh, in damages, and in, in, that was in February 2011, I believe. Bank of America has appealed the decision, and on Friday, the, the, court, uh, the court is going to be hearing the appeal. Uh, so he's really, um, uh, this is an important few days for, for Michael. So, Michael Winston, could you stand up? So let's, let's talk about discovery now, after this long-winded uh, opening. Um, so let's talk about, so Eric, start with you. Uh, let's get a better sense of your whistleblower story, okay? Uh, and without getting into too many financial weeds, um, so could you tell us something about your background? And why you went to Deutsche too? Yes. Yeah, so, um um, my background is um, as a mathematician. I uh, received my PhD in mathematics uh, from NYU. And um, uh, I went uh, directly from there to Wall Street. Um, I, uh, I was what's called a quant, a quantitative analyst, uh, which means that I uh, modeled, uh, I, I developed pricing models, risk models, so I helped manage risk, I helped the uh, trading business. Um, I was at Goldman where I uh, focused on a particular kind of trade uh, known as uh, the leverage super senior, and I'm not going to bore you with the details, uh, but that was something that I spent a great deal of time and it was part of a team that uh, helped uh, price um, and have to help value and manage the risk for that kind of trade. Uh, when, I, um, when I joined uh, Deutsche Bank uh, in 2000, June of 2010, I was assigned uh, to look at uh, a portfolio, um, a portfolio of credit derivatives, uh, which I developed an expertise in uh, that contained that particular type of trade as well. So that's that's kind of how my whistleblowing story started. Okay, let's go another step. What did you start seeing? Um, so um, I realized pretty quickly that the people around me were not did not understand, did not value those trades correctly. Initially, I wasn't overly concerned because my assumption was that somebody else in the organization uh, did know and that um, this was uh, being handled correctly somewhere else. So I had faith in the, in the internal controls of the organization that they weren't uh, misvaluing the, these, these uh, trades. 
Um, I was tasked actually with developing a stress test for this particular portfolio, um, and I somehow assumed that, that things were being done correctly elsewhere. Um, and, um, but I, I still raised those questions, and uh, as, we, as the months uh, went on and the, uh, the, question, the answers were not uh, satisfactory, I started escalating my uh, concerns uh, up my chain of command to my boss, to my regional boss, to the people who specialized in this product who covered this particular uh, portfolio. And the more questions I asked, the more conflicting answers or troubling answers I received. And so more and more red flags came up. And then I went to other divisions, so to, to the finance division, which is ultimately uh, responsible for signing off on the valuations and on the balance sheet. And the answers I received were so troubling that I, uh, I went to the employee hotline and to compliance. So we'll get into that, into the discovery phase, in, I mean the disclosure phase in a second. But Michael, uh, could you now, I mean you, you're, you have a 30 year history, top executive, you worked at Lockheed, you, you worked at Motorola, great companies, for five years Countrywide I think recruited you and then you went there. So could you describe why you went to con you know, Countrywide? That's an interesting. That's and an interesting point. At which I'm, to start. I'm not sure. Does Can everyone hear? hear? Yes. I think that we need to. Now. Yes. yes perfect. perfect. We can get up close and personal. You can hear. Yes. So that's a great place to start because I was. Um, the position I had after serving as an executive officer at Motorola for 11 years was as the chief strategy officer of Merrill Lynch and Company on Wall Street. And right after 9-11, a call came. I was being driven uh, to our uptown office. We were all scattered to the winds. And a call came in from an unfamiliar exchange. And reflexively, my head told me, don't pick it up. But you know, when you have a Blackberry, it just moves. So I picked it up, and it was a recruiter from a company called Countrywide. I had never heard anything about Countrywide. I'd never, never heard the name Countrywide. But the guy knew all about me, and he gave me a heavy sales pitch, kind of like a used car salesman would give a sales pitch. And I asked him, why on earth somebody who is the global head of strategy for Merrill Lynch which is a hundred year old company, should consider going to a small company that uh, relatively unheard of. And he said, because one day in the not too distant future, we're gonna be bigger than you. And I thought, wow, that's kind of brazen and bold. And just before we, I said, well, thanks very much. I'm, I'm under contract, I can't really talk any further. And, just before we get, got off the phone, he said, uh, by the way, it was six weeks after 9-11 happened. He said, um, just wanted you to know it's 72 and sunny here. What's the temperature like in New York, in lower Manhattan in November? And I thought, wow, good point. <laughs> so, this same guy called me every winter for five years. And lo and behold, this tiny little company was becoming a financial powerhouse. And it was big enough to then secure and sustain my interest. And so just as I, I talked to Eric, when did you start? So you came out to California. Uh, when did you start seeing some problems? And also, could you, I definitely want you to talk about fund them. Well, that's a good place to start. Fund them, but fund them. Yeah, good. That's a good place to start, because that's actually where I, where and when I first determined there was a problem. I part, pulled up to the corporate headquarters, parked next to a car that had personalized plates that said fund them, F-U-N-D, space, apostrophe, E-M, uh, hyphen, E-M. No, apostrophe, E-M. And there was a fellow right next to the car. I thought he probably owned it. 
And I said, that's an interesting plate. You'd say the same thing. That's an interesting plate. What does it mean? And he said, um, that's Angelo Mazzillo's growth strategy for the year 2006. And I said, growth strategy? How can fundum be a growth strategy? I still don't know what it means. And he said, it means we fund every loan that we get requests for. That can't be. That doesn't make sense. What if the person has no job? He looked at me just like this and said, we fund them. But what if they have no assets? Fund them. What if, what if they have no income? Because you don't have to have a job to get income, right? Your, your investments make money. And he said, fund them. And I said, maybe it's because I'm new here. I don't get it. What criteria do you use in deciding whether or not to give somebody a loan? And he said, if they can fog a mirror, we'll give them a loan. Now that's been in just about every newspaper on the planet, that, that quote, I believe I heard it the first time, or I certainly heard it the first time that day. That was November 2005. <coughs> and I immediately went up to the office of, we're being taped, so I'll leave a name out, but I'm being honest, so I'll tell you, he was the president of Countrywide Home Loans. And I said, you're incentivizing the wrong behavior. You're encouraging people to get a lot of loans, irrespective of the quality of loans. And I reminded him that I had spent 11 years, in part, heading up the quality initiative called Six Sigma at Motorola. And I knew a lot about quality and that he needed to really reward customer satisfaction. You want to have satisfied customers if people are getting thrown out of their homes. And uh, so he tasked me with coming up with a strategy to embrace that philosophy. It turned out that the strategy, as well as me, were referred to as fancy grill work inside the boardroom. The strategy was never implemented. It was a way to put me off. And so that's when I first discovered it. So, Eric, you just started talking about going to the hotline. So could you sort of describe the disclosure? Um, yes, by the time I went to the hotline, um, I had received enough conflicting responses and there were enough red flags that I, I felt, I went back to feeling confident that what I had known previously was in fact the truth. So when you, when you go through this kind of process, when you ask people and they give you all kinds of answers, if the issue that you're raising is at all complicated, you start questioning yourself. And you ask, well, maybe there's another way to look at it. Maybe what they're doing is OK. Um, so when I went to the hotline, I, I basically I, I was at the point where I know what I know. Here's what I know. Here's what my experience was. Here's what I think is going on. And here's why I think it's wrong. And so I had a meeting that was uh, um, a couple of hours with, with uh, Deutsche Bank's uh, uh, head of litigation and compliance and with an external lawyer, both very senior people. And it was, um, I, I came in, into that meeting pretty naively because uh, I assumed I was helping an investigation. I didn't think I was uh, being brought there to kind of to help them cover or cover up whatever was going on. So, so at that moment, you were not calling yourself a whistleblower? Uh, I, well, certainly not, not a whistleblower um, outside the company. If, if anything, I didn't know that there was, I didn't think at that point that there was any actual wrongdoing. I was raising a concern that something was being done incorrectly and under the assumption that this now is going to be investigated and corrected. And presumably there's no wrongdoing, it's a mistake, but if there is wrongdoing, if the, the investigation finds wrongdoing, it'll, you know, they'll take care of it. But it, I didn't, certainly did not think that it, um, I thought maybe some senior people were, you know, did, might have done something wrong, but I certainly didn't think it was at the bank at the entire institutional level. And, and so then what happened, could you just go a little bit further in terms of what, what did you decide to do next or uh, after the hotline? So uh, after the hotline, uh, I received uh, there basically no response. So the, 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 the meeting with compliance was a, very, was a very strange affair because you're meeting with the lawyers and they're telling you 
you know, uh, everything you say we can use any way we want, but you cannot talk about uh, anything that happens here because of uh, attorney-client privilege. Subsequently, you know, much later, many months, actually probably more than a year later when I spoke with uh, my lawyers at Gap, they said, no, this, they, they were just trying to, to scare you. There's no such thing. I mean, if they're your lawyers, then they can't say what you're telling them. And if they're, if they're not representing you, then they, there's no attorney-client privilege here. Uh, but at the time, it, it certainly was something that, that I took into, into account. So I only told my boss. I told him that I had gone to the hotline. Um, I, didn't, you know, I didn't go in beyond that into, into too many details. I would received no response afterwards for several weeks. And at that point, I started, uh, my concern started uh, getting more, I was more concerned that this was actually something institutional because if this is an investigation, why am I not getting any information? And why, why are they consulting me? Why, why are they answering? Is there a point that you went outside the organization? Yes, and uh, so uh, there was a, after a few weeks of not uh, receiving any, any response, I told them, I think this is a matter of concern to regulators, including the SEC. And at that point, um, meetings were set up Initially, I was promised that I was every th all my questions were going to be answered by by the senior executives in charge. Uh, what really happened was that um, I was I, I received some information, but certainly not complete information, and not enough that would allay my concerns. But uh, they did manage to kind of they did try to make sure they knew everything I know, and wanted they, they wanted to know whether I'd gone to the SEC. They were very concerned w with that. So it certainly did not feel as though they were trying to address the concerns, really. It more felt like they were trying to do damage control. Um, okay. And Michael, could you uh, describe your uh, experiences with your, the first stages of disclosure, put that way? Well, I'll, I'll, seg I'll segue to it, be because the, the end to that story was it's clear that the irresponsible and unsustainable uh, allotting of loans to people who couldn't pay them back was going to have a cataclysmic effect in the world. And you could sort of see the way that movie was going to end. And so I started talking to, I didn't talk to any hotline, I talked to I was an executive in the company, so I had access to all the people who set policy and strategy for the company and, and told them what was going to happen. You know, almost like sort of heading into an, uh, you know, uh, an accident where you see it in slow motion. And, um, and, there were, and the hubcaps were starting to fall off early on the uh, regulatory agency, Moody's, uh, gave, uh, um, gave adverse ratings to Countrywide for a number of governance issues. And could, could you, um, yeah. You want me you to parse that? No, yeah, just let people know what, Moody, what that means in terms of a company having Moody's looking at them yeah. and having questions, I guess, as well. Moody's is a ratings agency. It rates your debt. If you're sound financially, the cost of your capital to fund your operations is significantly lower than if you have adverse ratings, which makes you a higher risk. If you're a higher risk to borrow capital to, uh, to lubricate your operation and your machinery costs you more money. So an adverse, it was, it was assessed that the adverse ratings that I had been given would have cost between five and seven billion dollars, added five to seven billion dollars to the cost of their capital. A lot of dough. So, um, oh, I'm losing my place. No, well, then, uh, then okay, you were, they are now looking at the company, you're being tasked with dealing with this. Yeah, actually, it's, it's funny how many times it's been said. Um, I, I want to clarify something. My, what I was tasked to do with Moody's was not write a report. It was go to Moody's, carry this report with the president of the company in the countrywide jet, and defend our actually indefensible actions to Mark Mandy, who headed up Moody's. And um, I was, uh, and I was told, you, you, 
this is job number one for you, they can shut us down. And they could have, the cost of capital could have been so great, you know this with your, that they could have shut down countrywide operations. $28 billion in uh, market capitalization, 65,000 employees, they could have shut us down. So it was very important that I perform well, and I wanted to perform well. But what I had told them was, here's my strategy. My strategy is to say, you know what? You dinged us on unsuccessful succession, you got us right. You dinged us on uh, excessive CEO and outside director pay, you got us right. You got us right on all the things. We're young, we're growing very quickly. That's what my job is, is to help them to professionalize, to do these things the right way. That was the story that we told them because that was the truth. What I was told was that I had to play ball on a different story. And, um, and I was told in no uncertain terms that um, what lied behind door B, their story, was the one I had to tell. And I simply said, I know what you're asking of me. I know why you're asking it of me. I'm not going to do it. I'm not your guy. And no, sorry. No, no. And um, within days of that meeting, that was between me and let's just say one of the top three guys in the boardroom. Within days of that meeting, um, it turned out later it was proven in court. It was demonstrated and submitted as evidence in court that Angelo Mazzillo the founder and chief executive officer wrote a note to that guy and said essentially he won't play ball with us I want him terminated immediately I didn't know that that no I didn't see that note for four years but I knew it existed because of the way people looked at me they looked right through me as if there were no mass there they they just looked as if I didn't, I was the quintessential dead man walking. And uh, Eric, how high, now we know here we're talking about top, top level of the company. How high do you think your disclosure, or let's say how high do you think the knowledge of your whistleblowing went? Um, so I, um the highest confirmed or direct meetings that I've had were the, were the head of litigation and compliance uh, for the Americas and with the um, uh, head of um, uh, market risk management for the Americas. But I know that this trade, uh, this particular, the particular treatment, the valuation of these trades um, and the risk went all the way up to the chief risk officer. Uh, and I was told by uh, senior executives that the issue had gone up to the uh, t tip of the pyramid. So I have every reason to believe that, uh, that it, it went to the top. Um, and I think that's confirmed by the reaction after the Financial Times story broke out and after my retaliation claim. If there had been, in fact, um, uh, any innocence of, or no, no knowledge at the top, I assume that I would have been uh, invited to speak in front of the board about this issue. I know that they discussed it, the CFO discussed it in his uh, earnings call and gave it a significant amount of time. So uh, the fact that they uh, chose not to, uh, not to hear my story, not to hear my side beyond uh, that, just the meeting with compliance, um, pretty much says it all to me. And so as I understand it, the two of you are unemployed at the moment. So could you, so now we're in retaliation phase. So could you both sort of describe that? But perhaps, Michael, you can start on that. Oh, my retaliation phase was very long. Um, I was surrounded by seven people who had worked with me on prior teams. People I had known when they were in their 20s and they were now in their 40s. So while it would have been easy for me to leave and go somewhere else, I had all these people who had uprooted their families and relocated thousands of miles away. So I was, stu and I knew if I left, they'd be shot immediately. So retaliation, um, I'll, I'll give you the sort of uh, short, short cycle. Uh, a team of 200, uh, when it started, 
Uh, the last day, my team was two. A budget of about 14, 000, uh, 14 million. When it started, uh, a budget of zero when it was done. Um, a bonus track record in the seven figures, my bonus at the end was zero. Um, the number of initiatives we had going was probably four dozen different strategy and organization structure and compensation and title, all, all sorts of initiatives that we had going, restructuring various businesses uh, was probably 40 and it went down to one. Um, but the interesting thing is, I re as a result of their retaliation, I really got to be familiar with Southern California because in seven months, they relocated my office seven times to seven different cities. Very nasty stuff. And, and so now during this process, and so you're both, well, I'm sorry, Eric? You're unemployed, so <laughs> describe that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my, my ordeal has not been as long so far. Hopefully it won't get to be as long as, as, um, as Michael's ordeal. Um, yeah, it's, been, it's been painful, but I think, I mean, at some level, uh, one of the students asked, you know, if there's, you know, there's so much retaliation and, and, uh, and uh, you're paying a personal price, and then you come on campus and tell us to, uh, you know, encourage us to, you know, well, we were not here to tell you to become whistleblowers, but we are here to tell you that uh, if you see something, say something. Um, and uh, so I, I want to focus on, the, on actually the, the, bright, the bright side, which was the Financial Times story when it did come out, and having that vindication. And the vindication wasn't everything that I had hoped for. I worked uh, a long time on it, and the, the reporters worked a huge amount of time on that story, and, and it required a huge amount of technical, and they uncovered all these things. And, um, and it was a great story, and they did a fantastic job, but then there's sort of the reaction afterwards uh, that was a little bit moot, uh, even though we felt that it was, a, you know, and I, f I feel now it's a very, very important uh, story to everybody because Deutsche Bank is, by uh, various measures, the largest bank in the world and maybe the most connected and systemically important. And for this, for this to have happened is, is uh, very alarming. Um, so, so, so I'm going to focus on the bright side is that that story came out and it, it, that story in itself was everything that I'd hoped for. And I, I, I did get that vindication at least when it came out. Well, Eric, did you have, no, did you, did you have some doubts? I know at the beginning you were saying you were doubted yourself in terms of that your evidence, but then you gathered more and more evidence. Did you have doubts about whether you should be doing this, you know, going forward, pressing these concerns? And uh, so I have that question, and I want to couple it with, did you speak with your wife about this, and, or your family, or your greater family, or your friends, and could you give us some feedback, too, in terms of what people were talking to you about? Um, yeah, I did. When I, when I first, the, there was a point where I thought, a uh, specific point where I thought this is, I, I might have to go to the, I, I, I probably need to go to the hotline, because I'm, I'm convinced uh, that, this is, that this is not right. Uh, and at that point, the only people I could talk to really were my family, my, uh, my parents, my wife, and I actually talked about it with them, and it's, it's a very tough uh, conversation to have because there's no way for them to understand. You know, can I say that, oh, you know, derivatives have to be marked to market, and Deutsche Bank is claiming to mark them to market, and yeah, they've sold, there's an embedded option they sold, and they're marking it at zero, or it's not zero. They didn't understand any of that. And, um, but they, they, they basically told me to do the right thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think you know my, my wife was very brave uh, doing that, and she paid a huge price. And uh, you know, I, I um, looking back, and I can I say that uh, there are times where I feel like yeah, I mean, was it fair to 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 make everyone go through what we went through and what we might still go through? Because I mean, these things could drag on for years and years, and who knows what's going to happen. Um, uh, I don't know, but I mean, sometimes you have to make decisions without without really knowing, you know, without without you having control over their consequences. So, and, and Michael, could you uh, speak about your discussions with your family, if you don't mind, as well as friends? And did you have doubts about this uh, as well? Um, 
zero doubts. I, we, we, the amount of fraud in Bank of America and countrywide was, we thought, unprecedented. I had never seen anything like it in my life. And, and uh, you remember the economy was strong in 2005. But we sort of knew what the end looked like and that it was ugly and that it was around the world. And so um, when, when I challenged that fundum thing and I challenged it, I mean, this is just the tops of the tree, I challenged it a hundred times. When I challenged it, I was ticking these people off, but I thought that what they were doing was way irresponsible and it made people feel great to get in, you know, you earn 28,000 bucks Really, you gave them a half million dollar loan and they earned 28, that's not gonna end up, end up well. So um, that plus uh, refusing to lie to a ratings agency, that's sort of refusing to break the law. There's, yeah, there, there's no gray area there. No, I didn't doubt it at all. Um, my daughter was away in graduate school at the time. My son was at home, still is at home. Um, so it was really, I, I, well, I spoke to her a lot, and uh, quite frankly, she said, Dad, why, why does it have to be you? Let someone else do it. Uh, and my son said, Dad, it has to be you, because you understand, I, 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 you know, I had 30 years of experience before I got there uh, in big companies, far bigger than that at the top of the house. So. I saw things more quickly than perhaps more junior people would. I, I saw it, and uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time, and it is not fair what happens to the families, and it is, it, the pain is excruciating, not only that they feel, but that you experience as you watch your child going through this. Um, whether they're being chased, by the defendants in a, in a vehicle, whether your, the electronics in your house is rewired and everybody's getting shocks from eight feet away from a light switch, whether um, you, whether it's knowing 100% that all your phone numbers are tapped. You keep getting new ones and they keep being tapped. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the guy who makes his kids park inside the garage because I want to make sure that their brakes don't suddenly go out while they're on an L.A. freeway. It's real. And so we are talking about organized crime here, um, you know, whether it's in the conventional sense of that word. I, I would like to, to talk about what Michael just mentioned, but I want to go to Eric first, but then back to Michael on this is what about all these other people? Why couldn't it have been all these other people? And, and what do you think is going on with them? I'm talking about your colleagues that also are aware. Um, or are they? Yeah, so they're, they're, you know, it falls into two categories. I, I think um, there are two, two instruments by which people are kept in place. One is by greed. So some people are very richly rewarded for... Uh, either turning, uh, turning and looking the other way or by actively uh, participating um, in the violations. And, and I'm not a lawyer, but I, I believe the name for that is fraud, when you intentionally uh, uh, hide losses in that magnitude, um, which I believe they, I have, I believe, absolutely believe that they deliberately did that. Uh, but I think the majority of people, certainly people at kind of my pay level, are kept in place, are kept in check by uh, using fear. They're afraid for their careers. They're afraid they look at me. And, you know, I heard from one person in particular who was concerned, and that person said, look what happened to you. So, and that's, that's how it works. And it's very effective. It's very effective. Um, so so I, think, I think that's where, where all those other people are. And that's not to say they're not, they're not just as good uh, or better people than I am. I understand where that fear comes from, because you don't want to make your family go through this. You might have, you know, you might have debt. Maybe you bought a house. Maybe you just can't afford to lose that job and to lose your career, um, and you can't take that risk. So, so it's, not, it's not to say anything negative about the colleagues that were aware of this. Now, I, I would add to that 
that since it's a fairly specific uh, and fairly narrow, narrow area, there aren't that many people who are in a position like me, like myself, to understand this. If I hadn't seen the same thing done correctly, it should be mentioned that it was done correctly at Goldman and, and you know, we like to paint everybody in the same brush, but the truth is that I've never, you know, I, I, when I was at Goldman and I was promoted to VP there, I've, I've been there for several years, I haven't seen anything that, I, I, I don't think something like that would have happened there. Uh, so I don't think all institutions, all banking institutions are the same, and I, I don't think every lender out there is like countrywide. Um, I think it's certainly not, you know, so, um, so I, I, I would say that there weren't that many people in a position to, to actually report on this. So in a sense, the responsibility was mine. If I didn't do it, there weren't a whole lot of people who could. And, and Michael, what about the, your coworkers? I know you're at pretty high level here, but other execs. Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about it in, 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 from two perspectives. Uh, my colleagues um, were very well incentivized to, to keep their mouths quiet. My team um, was counting on me to advocate for the company doing the right thing. That's all we really wanted them to do was the right thing, which is the legal thing, as opposed to the wrong thing, which is the illegal thing. That's all we wanted them to do. It, it, whistleblowing, what Eric did, what I did is, we're, we're not whistleblowers, we're, we just were doing our job. I was brought there um, at the end of a long career, I was brought there because they said they wanted to become his former employer. They wanted to be, they did no longer want to be a mortgage company. They wanted to be a broadly diversified financial services company. They said, Michael, think Goldman Sachs on the Pacific. Just help us to become Goldman Sachs on the Pacific. So what I was doing was not whistleblowing. It was helping them to become Goldman Sachs on the Pacific. And they said, green pastures, blue skies, weigh in wherever you feel you can be helpful. Well, I, you know, 10 years in aerospace, 10, 11 years in high tech, and 10 years in financial services, I have a lot of experience, so I, I saw a lot of th areas that needed improvement. I weighed in. They didn't like it. Now, what, and now talking uh, a, a little bit about the, all these folks, the, their great silent majority uh, yeah. in your companies. Uh, now, Michael, you've had, you've gone through the, all this litigation. Could you describe some of the, some of the testimonies, some of the uh, support or lack of support that you might have gotten, certainly in wow. terms of maybe even touch on the testimony of the top people in the com company? Um, well, let, let me talk about my team, uh, yeah. who, had, who had all moved back to where they had come from, and therefore were not under the jurisdiction of the court. Every single one came out and testified on my behalf at great peril, at great personal cost. They are my heroes. They were magnificent, every single one. Um, there were also some very junior people who stood to lose their positions and did, who testified on my behalf. Um, as you might expect, the president of Countrywide Home Loans, the fellow who I cited earlier, um, he denied that I had ever made those proposals to him. He denied that he had ever met me in his office. And he denied that there were ever proposals focusing on quality of leadership equals the quality organization. Um, he denied it upon pe uh, penalty of perjury raising his right hand and swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So, of course, I was obliged to submit as evidence over 357 emails from him to me referencing those meetings, 17 40-page decks, each time talking about let's go for quality, for customer satisfaction, for quality service, and for leaders who focus on quality, not quantity. 
So he denied it. Uh, by the way, the uh, wow, we're on film, so this could really hurt me. Angelo Mazzillo, oh. <laughs> who was the chairman of the board and chief executive officer and founder, <laughs> I said that so that if he's listening, and he will be, he'll hear. He denied that he ever heard the name Michael Winston. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know what position I held in the company. But we found a letter from him citing that I hold a, quote, significant, comma, very high level position in the company. We found videos of him in which he was referencing an audience like this and saying, as our new management guru, Michael Winston, says, and, oh, by the way, here is Michael Winston. So um, his credibility really was uh, thrown. Uh, went, he was dismissed completely by the audience. He was very angry. So, so the, I think the thing you're looking for is um, my trial is the only civil trial that that individual has been compelled to testify in front of. He, it is the only trial he's attended. And in fact, the entire executive management committee was compelled to testify in that trial. He doesn't like me much for it. Um, they were not truthful. My uh, trial lawyer and I documented nearly 1,000 perjurious statements on material events that, were, that uh, was articulated by that team. Uh, and we commemorated it before the district attorney, the Department of Justice, before the LA County Sheriff's Department. And um, between saying they never got it after we had proof that it had been signed for by them, between saying, well, yes, they do have it, but somehow they can't find it, after trying over 20 times for 18 months, we have the idea that they're just going to look the other way and let this one slide. But my so, you, oh, go ahead. Yeah, um, my experience with the SEC was, well, I don't know if yours was, mine yeah. was hollow. Um, I called them many times and a response was promised to me many times. Because I, as I said, I saw this early. Nothing was done about it. The calls were not returned to me. They say, if you see it, say it. But should you say it if they don't do anything with it? So I'm, um, now one of our sponsors today is the journalism program. Uh, and mass communications. And so uh, let's talk about the journalists now. You've both had experiences, different experiences. Eric, uh, you've already started to describe your experiences with Financial Times. Um, so could you describe, though, the, that process of, of meeting with the journalists or what you thought about the result and et cetera? Um, yeah, so initially, um, uh, I have no media background. I didn't know anything. I didn't know what I was doing. But it was clear to me that my story is going to be hard to tell uh, because it's so technical and because I'm up against such an institution. Uh, the fear was that it would somehow get completely buried, that the journalists would just either wouldn't understand it or botch the story or that, um, or that they would believe uh, the other side. The smoke, what, I, what I believe is a smoke screen and smoke and mirrors that they use to, to deflect the issue. Um, so with the help of, uh, of uh, Gap, and they have uh, an, an excellent uh, uh, media team, um, um, and with uh, Labaton uh, and Sushara, which is the law firm that, uh, that is helping me with, uh, with the SEC, um, I, uh, I contacted the, uh, the Financial Times, and, um, and I, they did an enormous job, just uh, unbelievable, in terms of how much they uncovered. They, other than the, maybe the technical details, technical, say, mathematical or finan financial engineering details, 
uh, they, they know about the story so much more than I do. And I should, you know, we, we talked earlier about why, about the silent majority. Well, I, I should thank here, there are two people, two additional people that I've never met, I didn't know about when I started raising my concerns, who raised the same concerns and far more than those before me. And they didn't know about each other either. So there are three, three whistleblowers. Um, and I should thank them. They were very courageous to do what they did. Uh, I know that one of them got, got retaliated. I think probably both of them got retaliated against. I, I don't even know the third person is anonymous. I don't know who he or she is. But uh, I think the Financial Times did a fantastic job in un uncovering all of that, in understanding, going from, you know, from zero to 100, and understanding what, the, what this was, what, these, what, you know, what, what the trades were, uncovering all kinds of documents uh, and, and, and other issues. So, so I was very, very happy uh, with the product um, that came out of it. And I was, um, the response then in the German media was, was I thought, was very good. Um, I'm, I'm a little slightly disappointed by the, by the response on the, on the U.S. side uh, from the other media outlets so far. And if I, I'd like to add, too, is that you, you received a fantastic editorial, supportive editorial by the Financial Times, which is really going that whole nother step um, beyond uh, just the, the prominent front page story, stories. Uh, and in addition to that, they also have followed up their original story with getting experts to examine the evidence and these experts uh, collaborating um, your, your whistleblowing. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that as well. I think for academics, and I think this might be a good opportunity to also thank you for having us here because I know that it's, it takes a lot of courage also for an academic program to support, you know, obviously, you know, my former employers, at least upper management, is not too happy to see me yeah. anywhere. So, Which comes to the second uh, sponsor today is the School of Accounting in the College of Business, as well as the College of Law and the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. Uh, so, Michael, you've had much longer experience uh, with New York Times, oh, the, the media across the country, actually. Could you describe your experiences and um, perhaps maybe even the latest, um, uh, the, the latest documentary on um, Frontline called The Untouchables two, two weeks ago? Yeah, so my story was carried a lot. I, I, I think um, it had nothing to do with me. I, I, I wasn't central. I think it was the fact that this guy was compelled to testify at, at uh, my trial, and so were his colleagues. I think so. At one point, it was in a thousand newspapers concurrently, um, and I, like you, I. I, I think this is like your thing. I was um, inundated with media requests in the beginning. Um, and, and I said no to everyone except one person, Gretchen Morganson of the New York Times. I, I had been reading her columns for years. She was so tenacious, so right-minded, so determined um, that the financial services industry regain its moral compass. Um, that when I got contacted by the Times, I said only if she's if she interviews me. And um, she did many times and published uh, a number of articles. And she, and she's the only one. And I read these things just like you. I mean, most often the media is more wrong than they are right. I don't even recognize a, a, a huge part of my story had to do with a toxic building, people who were getting sick, being hospitalized, and, um, and my first trying to get it resolved locally and mitigated and uh, with the immediate management. And, and uh, it was only when I realized they were not going to fix it that I went outside to Cal OSHA Nine out of every ten media stories doesn't mention that, and that is the the that was the tipping point. That's what got me to say no. I'm I'm not gonna, you know, the loans I, I thought I could work on with them to fix. Um, it, it, I made it very clear I was not gonna lie 
uh, on Countrywide's behalf or, any, or Bank of America's behalf or anybody's behalf to a regulatory agency or anyone else. It's just not who I am. Um, but it was the, the, um, the threat to perhaps life in, the, in that complex. Um, that's when I, I put it all on the line. And uh, ironically, nine out of 10 uh, publications on what happened here don't even mention it. And, and that, I think, was the tipping point. Yeah, I, I, I'm very happy with what uh, the, the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and Washington Post and, you know, all the ours, they, once it's in one major one, it gets picked up in all of them. So I'm very happy with what they've said. Now, would you, first of all, I think what is probably in the mind of a lot of people is would you do it again? So if you could both sort of respond to that, um, if you had to do over. Uh, can, I, can I go? You, yeah, please. <laughs> Well, I, you know, the longer this drags on and the more I'm threatened with, hey, if, if we lose this one, this is their fourth appeal, if we lose this one, we'll just take this to the U.S. Supreme Court. They'll, you know, and, and then the intergalactic Supreme Court. <laughs> um, yeah, there are times I think, geez, I'm getting tired. They're beating me up and... Um, and it's, it's starting to take a toll. But would I do it again, given the building circumstance? No choice. No chance I would not. Given, given what I learned about the loans? Absolutely. Because I, I, I actually think the economy is better now than it would have been had I not made a ruckus at these, uh, you know, ninja, no, no income, no job, no asset loans. And, um, yeah, I think we helped. And, and uh, you know, the economy, I think, fellows like Eric, and, and there are many other silent un unsung heroes who tried to stop the corruption and the illegality and the wrongdoing. And, and you know, you, you don't think you're doing it. it it's, it's not, you're, in a you're put in a position to help on behalf of many people, you don't see it as a choice. You're there, you understand what's going on, it falls on your shoulders. Yeah, I'd do it again. Eric. Uh, I tend to agree with Michael, and I think, you know, just the chance, you know, I, haven't, I've, I hadn't met Michael before uh, two days ago, so just the, the opportunity to, um, to be around people that I really, I really can really admire and look up to and, and feel good about myself. Is um, is worth a lot. There are times, you know, the family price is very high, and I think, um, you know, so there there are definitely times where, you know, and there there is a, there are times of isolation, and it's only been really since I was terminated, um, a little over a year. So there are times when I, when I do regret it, but uh, I think for on the on the whole, I, th I definitely think it's it's worth it, and uh, and I'm trying to be an optimist about this and to think that uh, in the end it'll all work out for the best. For, for everyone involved. And, and right before, we're going to go to questions right after this question. Uh, could you, um, what, what do you have to say to this audience? Mostly the students here, but everybody else too. But what, what do you have to say in terms of their own career path or what perhaps uh, you think they should be thinking about or uh, et cetera? And, and you go ahead, Michael. Um, wow, that, that's just sprung on us. I, you know, I, I, it wasn't in the script. I, I, thought, I thought over lunch, we were with another group before, perhaps some of you were, were in that group. We're being asked, you're being asked to think of a time when you were faced, sometime in your life, when you were faced with an ethical challenge and did the right thing. And think of a time that you were faced with an ethical challenge and did not do the right thing. Either let somebody else do it or let nobody do it. There's a difference, right? There's a difference in you. There's a hollowness in you when you could have risen to the challenge and didn't. And, and that hollowness can never be filled except 
with the desire, dedication, and motivation to not let that happen again. The next time a situation comes up that requires courage, everyone talks about having the courage of your convictions. I used to say that all the time. I went from being a wealthy guy to now being a struggling guy. I went from having a great career to now having no career. Um, I went from traveling first class or private to now traveling very little. But I've learned more about myself over these past seven or eight years than I ever knew. And I have been able to dig deep within myself and find a strength that I didn't know I had. And while I hate the path that I had to take to get it, I got it. It doesn't, and, and as Eric said, um, the end of this story isn't written yet. My end is gonna be great. Eric's end is gonna be great. And here's why. We did the right things and told the truth about it. They did the wrong things and consequently lied to cover it up. As my lawyer told me many years ago, when I said, Ted, how are these people who are 12, 14 strangers, two alternates, how are they gonna know? That, uh, I see the Bank of America, country, all they're doing is lying. How are they gonna know? And he said very wisely, the truth has a ring to it and it resonates. And he said, falsehoods have a clang to them, a jarring sound. The jury will know. Trust that the jury will know. I trusted, and in my instance, the jury did know. Oh. Eric. Uh, that's a very big question. Um, if there are uh, graduate students here or PhD students here, I would a slightly more practical uh, recommendation would be make sure to, uh, to get a postdoc before you go get a job in the real world. It's a nice thing to do, and I, I'm, if there's one thing I'm kicking myself is for not doing that. On a slightly higher level, uh, I would say that uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure that I would necessarily recommend uh, doing what, what, what we did for everyone. I think, I think it really depends on temperament, and when I look at some of my colleagues who are not doing that, I think they might be doing the right thing for them, for their situation. But I think if, if, it, if it's, and this is, I think, I'm maybe saying the same thing that Michael is, is saying in, in other words, if that's something that's burning in you, that you, you can't really stand that, you, you're not, you know, you, you're not gonna it's, gonna, it's gonna kill you one way or another. You're just gonna suffer, and so you might, you might, as, well, uh, you might as well do that. And I think there, there are quite a few people who, who are like that, who just can't, you know, they, they can't take the fear, you know, uh, the, or the, the, the feeling of oppression, that somebody's, forcing you to do things that you really don't want to do, that you don't believe in, uh, that you know are wrong, and you can see what the impact is on everybody else. And uh, I think for, every, for, for both of us, we lived through uh, the financial crisis, and we saw it kind of, you know, I, I was in the engine room and saw it very up, up close and personal. I, kn I knew what kind of decisions were involved pre before it came and during uh, that, uh, and what kind of impact they had. And so it was really a feeling of, you know, this, what, they're, what they're doing here is so wrong. There, there's just, there was, uh, for me, there was no way that, that I was going to let that, uh, that I was going to let that go. And, and I think even the times when I regretted or even the times when I was in the company and, and had uh, doubts about what I was doing, I don't think, in reality, I don't think I really had a choice. Um, but that's, that's a personal thing. Can I, can I jump in for a yeah, second? absolutely. It, it, Eric and I have talked many times over these two days, and it, it, it's... In the beginning, you, you do question yourself. Everybody else is seeing this. Why aren't they saying something? Well, maybe, maybe they know that the company has been given some special dispensation to do what we thought was against the law. Maybe they, maybe... But over time, you realize that no, there has been no special dispensation. Your intuition is serving you correctly. It's not that they, they know something more than, than you know. You know what you know. And that's when you have to swing into action. We both said this this morning. That, um, it is very painful to be a whistleblower. Pain unlike anything you, you can imagine. Um, 
And why do we do it? Why did we do it? Be because the pain of not blowing the whistle, we know would be greater than the pain of blowing the whistle. And that's all. Uh, so let's, let's move to questions. Uh, I, first of all, I have an ad to say is that uh, sign up for, um, like us on, face, like us on Facebook, uh, www.whistleblower.org, and, and uh, foodwhistleblower.org as well. And uh, for everyone who's, who likes us for the next, I think, four days, we get a dollar. So that would be uh, help, help our funding just by doing that. that. And also, obviously, you'll be uh, able to see uh, the things that we're doing in, way into the future. Uh, but with that, let's uh, go to questions. Yeah, uh, now that we have that uh, uh, shameless shill out of the way there. Uh, um, the uh, questions can be um, asked here at the uh, standing mic, and I have this one that we'll pass around as well. So do you have questions? Thank you very much, and congratulations. Hopefully, they'll make a movie about you guys soon. Um, I think it's uh, a good opportunity, the fact that you both were at different financial firms before you, you blew the whistle. Could you please say, uh, in terms of organizational culture, you know, how people usually behave and how they interact with each other, uh, what was different between the previous financial institution than the one that made you blow the whistle? Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, from the point of view of a quant, so at, at, uh, at my previous employment at Goldman, without going into too much information, which I'm not sure what is proprietary and what is not, uh, they have a very, very tight uh, control over their models, their trades, the uh, correspondence between models and trades. There have to be sign-offs, so you have to have for each, each, uh, for each, uh, their, their tests, and for each test, for each model, and for each trade, you have to have two quants who sign off on it. Uh, it's just a culture, and if, if there's something, anything is wrong for any period of time that exceeds, you know, a few days, you're in that corner office with a partner, and uh, PMD, it's, it's called, uh, having a, you know, the most uncomfortable conversation of your life. And, uh, and I, was, I was one of the, one of the quants who had to be signed off on that particular trade. So I, I, I knew how it was supposed to be done. Um, I don't know, you know, maybe there are parts of Deutsche Bank where, this, where there's a similar uh, setup. Uh, I, I haven't seen that. And where I was, it was just nothing like that. I mean, I... I to me, it seemed more like more like uh, it wasn't risk management. It was more uh, uh, okay. I don't I don't want to use too strong words, but uh, uh, how can we just uh, uh, cover up risk? And in that in that case, also valuation. I'll take a stab um, with a twist at the end. Uh, I I'll. Limit, uh, I'll talk about Countrywide, not Bank of America. Um, I know Countrywide better, although now I know Bank of America at least as well. Sad, uh, sadly for me. Um, Countrywide, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, everything that I had stock in is now Bank of America. And for some reason, they don't want to give it to me. Go figure. So, so um, uh, Countrywide, when it was at its apex, 65,000, 28 billion, about 3 billion in, in uh, net profit, um, very top-down, very micromanagement, very much the military, very little discretion, uh, um, it, n uh, zero independence of thought, uh, zero creativity. Um, Good soldiers, uh, smart, smart, very smart people. I mean, they, they grew that place in a hurry, and they, they were hiring the Eretz of the world, you know, PhDs, brilliant straight-A averages. Um, it, 
but, but uh, they had their way of doing things, the cowboy way. That's what they called it. We're cowboys here. So, sort of like there are the laws, and then there is the countrywide way. And it was used in juxtaposition to, well, there's that way. Yeah, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank and all that. But then there's the countrywide way. We're special here. We do it differently. I'll compare that and contrast it not with Merrill Lynch. Uh, Merrill Lynch was highly professional, very... Um, everybody had worked for high pedigree companies. Uh, everybody was a Harvard MBA or a Stanford MBA. I'll compare it and contrast it to Motorola, which was my predecessor uh, employer for 11 years. Motorola, um, flat, not hierarchical, uh, open, easy communication, new ideas flourished, people were appreciated and recognized. Nobody was afraid. In financial services during my time at, at Bank of America and Countrywide, everyone was afraid of everything. Stepping out of line. Um, and, and I know that still in the world there are companies out there that celebrate individuality and encourage teamwork. And I, I, I know this because I spent my first 20 years working at companies like that. But it's a dim, dimly lit, hazy memory for me. If, if you guys find a company that celebrates the uniqueness in you, grab on to them and never let them go. Because it's, a, it's, a one, it's amazing when you work for a company that brings out the best in you. Doesn't focus so much on uh, hiring, you know, just, oh, we're going to get the best people. How about getting the best out of the people you already have? So I, I was blessed. I had 20 years of working for companies like that. Uh, actually, 25 years. And, and then not. Up here? Hello, sir. My name is Jeffrey Warner. I have a question for Mr. Winston. Yes. Every morning, like when you wake up, what pushes you to continue? Like what drives you and what attitude and mindset do you have when you're facing obstacles that are like seemingly unconquerable? Wow, you, like every third word cut out. But let me see if I can rephrase. Uh, what again? gets me up every morning? I said every morning when you wake up, what pushes you to continue and like what drives you to continue like when you're facing obstacles that are seemingly unconquerable like you are? Um, I'm in the right, they're in the wrong. Right makes might. I don't care how many there, there are of them, they're in the wrong. That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is also for uh, Mr. Winston. I know how much you'd probably want your case to be over with this next appeal that they're taking. You know, hopefully, oh, it, it, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I could understand. I would want the same thing. I do but, have rearview mirrors, and I'd love to see those companies behind in my rearview mirrors. Do you think that uh, this kind of issue that you and your constituents all deal with? would be better served if a case like yours or your case was taken to the Supreme Court? Like, uh, in history, cases like that have been given um, national attention when they were taken to the Supreme Court, like vis-a-vis -vis, um, Brown versus the Board of Education? Wow. Well, you, you know, that, that's, that's a great question. And I'll answer it in a, in a way that would, would surprise even me, and I'm the answerer. Um, <laughs> I so desperately want the perjury that I suffered from to be explored at the highest levels that I would be, I would be willing to suffer yet another five years if somebody could look at that and say, you know what, that is against the law. We are going to punish them for breaking the law and that punishment for perjury 
involves incarceration. I'd be willing to suffer just about anything for that to happen. Because I think the next generation of criminality is alive and well right now. And they're looking to see if anybody's been, punishment, been punished, and thus far nobody has. So whereas your mom and my mom and your mom and dad told you uh, crime doesn't pay, crime has paid. And there needs to be something that deters future action or this will happen again. It's happening all the time. These, these things, uh, you remember when Enron, well, we thought, okay, that's the end of that. There's all this regu regulation and legislation. It's ha criminality is at its all-time apex. Some tens, as I said to your group yesterday, tens of trillions of dollars have been sucked dry from the global economy. And nobody is guilty? How is that possible? Somebody has to be punished for that. Could, could you compare it to the savings and loan? Yeah, well. Uh, uh, scandal, which some people might remember not in the You 80s. remember the savings and loan scandal? It was bi big in Southern California. It was big all over the country, but everything happens first in Southern California. The mortgage <laughs> prices. Yeah, so um, they, they focused on holding people accountable. And if you look at that show, I, I looked at it because there were some very unflattering close-ups of me on it, but if you look at that show, Frontline, um, they confirmed that over 1,000 people were thrown in jail for that savings and loan scandal. Now, the uh, mortgage crisis, the credit crunch, the market meltdown of 2007 and 2008 was by professors' estimates 400 times great, well, first of all, it was global, and the savings and loan scandal was not global, it was 400 times greater than, in scope and depth and penetration, the savings and loan scandal. Number of CEOs or executives, a thousand were, were locked up in the savings and loan. You know the number of CEOs and executives that have been locked up for this, zero. That is wrong, that needs to be fixed. And if my case can be a test case that can fix that, I'm all for it. Yeah. And, and this is not, this is very concrete in the sense, of, also in my case, uh, of, um, you know, uh, just um, under a year ago, uh, there was a similar, there were similar losses incurred by another uh, global bank, uh, JP Morgan, in, in securities that weren't that different, in credit derivatives. And they uh, actually, as far as I know, you know, it's, it's not, I, I don't, they actually, conf they actually, ultimately, at least top management went out and, uh, and uh, uh, fessed up to this. And uh, they, uh, senior people lost their jobs, they lost bonuses, they took the hit. And they did, but they did the right thing, ultimately. I, I don't know, you know, there might have been some violations initially, I don't know, but, but certainly, ultimately, the CEO did the right thing. Now, those you can you can be sure that those uh, that uh, top executives are looking at the Deutsche Bank case and they understand they know exactly what they did because uh, you know everybody knows what those uh, what those uh, credit derivatives were and they're saying wait if if they can get away with this why why should we take the Jamie Dimon route we could have uh, the CEO of J P Morgan could have also um, uh, tried to hide those losses and maybe he would have succeeded and you know all those people might still have their jobs and their bonuses and why won't they do it next time. So this is this is a very con concrete issue that if you let if you let people get away with it, uh, it's you know this is really going to happen again. So, yeah. A question. I don't know how much you want to dwell on it, but uh, you're both very obviously talented, highly experienced individuals in your respective fields, uh, exemplary employees. Uh, you know. How is it that you're experiencing difficulty in terms of, you know, like the seeking employment if you are? Uh, what has been the response? Well, you know, what, what, what has been, you know, going on in terms of, you know, that area? Yeah, in terms of the, how hard, why is it hard to find another job? That's oh, why is it hard to find another job? Um,
you know, I, I'll give you, I'll give you just an honest answer. Um, I have no idea. It, that it is hard is absolutely undeniable and controvertible. Why it is hard when people, uh, you know, uh, in in my company, pretty much the whole world knows that what Countrywide and Bank of America did were wrong. I mean, they've paid nearly sixty billion dollars in fines. You don't do that if you're doing right stuff. You do that if you did wrong stuff. And I saw it early and called them on it and tried to stop it. Um, so I, I have, you know, I, um, like you, I, I used to get jobs four and five at a time offers. And um, uh, that seems to have faded into the days of yesteryear. It could be, certainly not in my colleague's case, but it could be with me that, um, you, you know, I'm just a tad older than I once was, um, but I think I still have game and I, I, I still do what I do in the same way that I do and can, can and want to help a company. Um, but there's a stigma wrongfully attached to whistleblowing, even though people know that especially during a recession, companies take shortcuts. And maybe the quality of your food isn't as high. Maybe the quality of the food in the restaurants that you frequent isn't as high. Maybe your air and water isn't as clean because you know you can shave off a little here. Maybe your airplane is not being serviced as frequently as it used to. And one day you look up and you see the top of the plane is blown off, which has happened. So I think these things are good to do. I think they save lives. I think they nourish and, and enrich lives. I think what I did was a good thing. And I think if you asked a thousand people, if, if I asked everybody in this room, is it a good thing or a bad thing, if you have a building that's toxic, for you to try to get those people out of that building, they'd say it's a good thing. If you see that loans are being given to people who have no wherewithal to pay them back, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing to stop those loans from going to people so that they don't get thrown out of their own home? Horrible feeling, I imagine. I think people would say it's a good thing. So if all this stuff is a good thing, what Eric did, what I did, why is it we're having so much trouble? I don't know, but we are. Um. I think it's a tough job market for anybody right now. Um, I, can, I, can, I can tell you, though, in a, kind of an amusing, uh, dark humor uh, story that uh, uh, happened to me right when, the, when the, um, the story of the Financial Times came out. It came out, I think, December 5th or 6th. And I had, uh, I had managed, I, I didn't get a whole lot of interviews, but I had managed to get uh, a few here and there. I think, you know, you, I can suspect that a lot of Wall Street firms, they talk to each other, HR departments might talk to each other, uh, people know each other, it's really not a big, very big place. So some of them might have gotten wind, uh, so some, some places might not have wanted to interview me at all. But I think, but this was one particular company, uh, financial, I'll broadly say it's in finance, I'm not going to say what or where. And I passed the first interview, which was technical, and they set up the second interview, and the second interview was right after it came out and was literally a day or two after it came out. And I talked to the hiring manager and I said, uh, before we have this, uh, this second interview, this, uh, this meeting, I, I want you to Google my name and you'll see the, the story that just came out. And I want you to talk to your manager and see you know, if, if it's still okay for you to, to have this interview with me. And um, I never heard back, so. Okay, can I have a go back, just following on what Eric said? Yeah, I have been told by many people that as soon as my thing is over, it, all, everything that, that I lost will come back to me again. But I've also been told that it'll never be over. So, <laughs> so hope springs eternal. <laughs> okay, Frank, one, one more Take one more question. Now, are you talking when 
this whole ordeal is over, have you thought about writing a book that maybe higher institutions like FIU can use as a guideline for their students? Because I my feel is that many higher institutions, they don't touch the topics of ethics and compliance. And having you, any of you or the two of you, writing a book because you had the inside scoop about guidelines and ethics and compliance and whistleblowing will be it would be amazing. So, so I'll answer. I, I have written a book. We're marketing it. We'll, um, I have a, a very noteworthy literary agent, and um, I think she priced it too high, and that's why it's not gone yet. But I think it's going to go. But, but I, I found, interestingly, that I've, I've written a second book, and, and, um, and I already have a publisher for that book. And I think the reason is because it's not on whistleblower. It's what it's it's on what I've done my whole life: organization strategy. And and I did that. I didn't do it with the intent to sell it. I did it with the intent to get back to who I am. I'm I'm Michael Winston. I'm not a you know I'm not Michael Winston the whistleblower. You know I'm Michael Winston, the guy who was with Motorola and Lockheed and. Donald Douglas for a decade, and, and, and I do what I do. I love doing it, and I do it well, so that's what I wrote about. And it was very healing. I commend you to it. Gary. Um, I, I think, you know, I, um, Michael has a much more interesting story to tell. It's been, you know, he had a very long, successful career in corporate America, and then the ordeal that he went through. I'm hoping that my story will be shorter and that It'll be just one uh, one chapter that nobody will want to read anyway, and uh, so. But uh, I, 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 right now, there's there's no road there's no roadmap. I you know I wake up every day and try to figure out what the next thing to do is, and, uh, and I've definitely thought about all kinds of career changes. Obviously, as someone who has a PhD, you know, um, I, I've I've been longing for academia uh, as well. So you know, a lot, a lot of other things that maybe. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, I don't know, did you tell everybody, uh, I was working the door, uh, did you tell everybody that this was your first venture and a public? Oh, yeah, and I, I really appreciate, by the way, for you being such a, such a, a patient uh, and accepting audience. Believe it or not, I, I consider myself a good speaker for a mathematician, which really doesn't say anything at all. <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, but I, uh, I, I really thank you for the, the support you have. Um, I don't think, it's very hard to, if I were in your shoes, I don't think I would understand how important the concept of vindication is and having support, moral support, and hopefully you'll never need that kind of support. Uh, maybe some of you did, you know, went through something difficult, but uh, it, it really is a, a tremendous um, psychological boost uh, to have that feeling of support and vindication, and it, it, it's really priceless, so thank you. It, I'll, I'll cheerlead for that as well. Vindication is everything. That what you did made sense, that you did the right thing, and that it's, it's good that you have done it. Absolutely. And thank you all for coming out to Michael's coming out party, uh, whistleblower coming out party uh, here at FIU. And w I mean, we're delighted that this was the place. So thanks for being here. Michael, thank you for being here. Your aunt? Yes. You did? Did, no. did we? No. Michael's this, this aunt is, from Boca Raton. My aunt, my aunt Millie Sigadil. She is my mom's baby sister, and she came down to see, to join you and see this event today. <laughs> And you know, we're FIU, we're taking students uh, anytime, so just go ahead and enroll, sign up, and come back and see us more frequently. Uh, and Louis, my, thank you very much, Michael. Louis, as always, uh, a wonderful experience. And uh, so let's give everybody a round of applause.